Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome again to Finding Me in the ITB Networks today. A very special occasion at the UNISA Decolonial Summer School with a very special guest. Professor Nelson Maldonado Torres is a professor at the Caribbean Latino Studies at the University of Rutgers University. And uh, we've had him on our show before, but I thought this was an ideal opportunity to engage him further because each year he expands his ideas, his concepts, his discussion, and comes forth with amazing new ideas, especially in South Africa now, where we're facing very many questions about decolonization and decoloniality. So with that, thank you very much, Nelson, for being here and for sharing your time with me again. You're welcome. Thank you. You know, um, what is very interesting for me is that you speak a lot about Fanon, and I know you, much of your work is engaged, and you engage around in, in the thoughts and reflections of Fanon. But you spoke specifically today, and, and not much of it, but you mentioned it, was about Fanon's writings about the Algerians uh, in the context of damnation. So can you tell us a little bit more about this, and why was this important to Fanon? Yes, I think that Fanon um, started to think about the condition of colonialism in the Caribbean, and about the uh, experience of being black, of living as a black person. And through that, he began to develop um, um, analytical tools to understand uh, colonialism and racism. But of course, he always understood it, and he's clear even in Black Skin, White Masks, that this is an example of colonial relations that are happening globally. So he was well aware that the system of colonialism, you know, it was global and many, it affected multiple, many, many different kinds of groups and people. And so um, he ends up in Algeria as a director of a hospital. And it is there the revolution begins and he finds himself in a situation where both, let's say, torturers and the tortured are coming to the hospital, both seeking uh, psychiatric care. And, uh, and that is a, you know, that is a, a quite an ethical position for someone in, in uh, who is uh, working as a as a medical doctor. And what he shows was to side with uh, the revolution, and to because at the end the the sickness, the illness that he was fighting against was the illness of colonialism. And he saw directly how colonialism affected the psyche of the colonized and the colonizer and how it was creating so much havoc. So he also saw revolutionary activity as part of the uh, cure of the colonized subjects. So at the end, it was not completely crazy to leave the directorship of the hospital. That is, it was the imperative of curing people, of participating in, in, in processes of of health, of healing, that I think leads him to join the revolution. And in that process then also coming to then um, elaborate more the categories about colonialism, what it means to be colonized, right? what is colonialism. And so I think that through his reflections on the revolution and on the conditions of anti-Arab, anti-Muslim uh, racism, that he was able to expand the categories about the study of damnation that he initiated in Black Skin White Mask. And so I think that is um, it's something, for example, for black activists, it's important to recognize and to understand that Fanon was also theorizing about Muslims, and many of the non-black Muslims in Algeria, yes. just like it's really important for Muslims and non-black Muslims to understand that the same revolutionary that was in Algeria was also writing about blackness in the Caribbean. Yes. So I think that his work invites an expansion of the usual sort of paradigms for approaching colonization or culture or even religion. So, and so in his work, is he cognizant of the religious dimension that features in the lives of the colonized and the effect uh, on, the, on the colonized from the colonizer specifically and particularly because of their religion? Yeah. He, is, um, he is aware, he doesn't develop, he doesn't do a significant, let's say, religious analysis. I mean, but he is aware and he talks about, uh, I think he treats it as the element, as a colonized cultural element, 
right? So when he writes about, for example, the veil, or he writes about uh, the, the, the practices of the family at the home, the relationships between fathers and daughters and sons and brothers and sisters and so on, he's clearly looking at the Algerian society, which is deeply shaped by Islam. Yes. And so um, in a way he cannot avoid but to uh, bring out. And in some cases he brings out more explicitly, more explicitly the religious elements uh, than, than other times. Um, what is not so much present in him is, um, so there is that recognition of how French colonialism is targeting Algerian people, the Algerian culture, but also Islam. What is less present is how then the Algerian are using Islam in a decolonial way, how the Islam is used decolonially, for example. However, um, he was, how he saw decolonization, it was about the possibility for Muslims, Jews, and Christians in Algeria to be able to practice Islam decolonially, Judaism decolonially, Christianity decolonially together in a, in a land that they consider theirs and that theirs, that sense of community and belong, belong, uh, belonging came by participating in the revolutionary process. So, so in order to achieve this freedom and to achieve this unity of purpose or a unity of being and living together, this tolerance, this plurality, etc., for Fanon it was important to be a revolutionary. Or to, yes, to, let's say, um, the goal is not simply to be tolerant to each other, the goal is, and how we make our ourselves worth of belonging to a community, is not so much by tolerating others, okay. right? Yes. It's by not being willing to be complicit with the dehumanization of anyone in that context, okay. right? Yes. That if you show yourself willing and you test yourself and you show your, uh, um, your will to, to become part of, of the solution addressing the problems of dehumanization, that very process itself leads you to connect with many people. That is the new community that is forming. Mm -hmm. And when you center on that, then the issue is not whether you are Muslim or you are Christian, it's whether we are all collaborating in this. And as part of that, there is a space for all differences. Right. But it's now it's not about tolerating the Muslim or the Arab or tolerating the Jew. It's about me enthusiastically recognizing and respecting and affirming your difference in as much as I know that that difference fights comes out for my dehumanization and the dehumanization of anyone when it's needed. So that's a very powerful moment and I think very visionary. It also points to the limits of liberalism then because the focus of liberalism is mostly on tolerance but not... It's not yes. No, it's very different from tolerance yeah. exactly. It's <laughs> yes, not about yeah. tolerating, it's about an action, yes. decolonizing an action and that is what leads to the creation of community. Yeah. So it's not different individuals being tolerant to each other. Yeah in their own isolation and individualism. It's about selves who are thrown in the world, acting with others, changing the world. And in that very process, you form a new community. Yes. So it's a genuine formation of, of community. Yes. And, and I think that's a powerful moment, and that's something that's missing in many, well, in the majority of the countries and communities of the world today, because everybody has shifted to this individual idea and the individual focus. Yes. And is that part of then the decolonial thought and the decolonial idea this which you teach at the UNISA Decolonial Summer School, raising those kind of knowledges, those ideas, because indigenous families, indi indigenous communities, indi indig ind indigenous societies were these plural societies that recognized each other, the humanity of each other, and supported each other. And the idea, I think that this year particularly, um, I've tried to be very emphatic that the process of reflection and theorizing um, cannot be primary to the process of formation community, that they both have to go together. So what I've done in my talks here is to challenge people, it's not only to inform people about different things, but it's also to challenge them to break the idea that they are there as the audience and they ask me questions. So yesterday, for example, I refuse to take questions. Okay. And I say, no, you can ask me questions when you reflect about what you're willing to do for the revolutionary, the decolonial process here in South Africa, wherever you're from. Right. Think about that first, what that entails, how willing, and then you can consider yourself worthy of asking a question, not only to me, but to anyone. Because, yes. So the idea is to move away from being an armchair critic, isn't it? But to actually engage the whole notion of action yes. and participation. Yes, that, that in order to affirm your humanity, the humanity is not something that 
in years in some in some part is something that we um, activate that we practice, right? And if I want to be recognized as a human being, asking a question, then I better show primarily my humanity by acting in a way that is human right. and humane. And, and so you're, you're forcing the audience basically to engage with what is happening in South Africa. And a big thing that's happening in South Africa has been the fall of the movement. Fees must fall, roads must fall, you know, the, the Afrikaans must fall, these conversations. I know you were here last year also in terms of decolonizing the university. Perhaps, you know, for many people are still struggling with this notion of decolonization and decolonizing the university. What is the primary, you know, message that you want to send? Because I see academics themselves and, and those are caught in the Eurocentric trap, you know, are struggling to understand what it means for them when we speak about decolonizing the curriculum, the university, etc. Yeah, I think that, I mean, what they need to, to, to realize that this is not something that they can understand in two minutes or five minutes or, or two days, that even their own understanding of how things work has been informed by very aggressive campaigns, mm -hmm. the media, the political parties, the... <laughs> global networks of power. And years. Uh, yeah, and, you, and, and, and not only coming from apartheid with the idea that, okay, if at least we become democratic, that would be the dream, democracy. And then liberal uh, democracy becomes the, the ideal to strive for. Yeah. And so you go from apartheid to liberal, to apartheid liberal democracy. What is there, what more to fight for? Why, you, you already have it. What you need is to do that well. Mm -hmm. But you see, that, that was the, it's sort of a setup and a trap. And so there cannot be democracy, real democracy, without decolonization. That's the issue. So you can, if you think that you already got decolonization, um, I mean democracy, without going through decolonization, you're living a false sense of democracy. Right? You're living, which is a lot of what liberal democracy allows to, to forge. Mm -hmm. Because it's about votes of the majority and so on and so forth, right? And, and so it suffices that you have the majority of certain kind of people to then... Right? To, to rule. Exactly, and, and so, or then you uh, manipulate the, the voting process or just you let the voting process be free, but then you control the economy and you keep the land. So none of those combinations, there can be no democracy yes. without people to having the opportunity to have the same access to the land. There cannot be democracy without the lack of distribution of resources and so on. Mm -hmm. So all of that is part of the colonization, but people have been so used to think about democracy in the more superficial way that it's so difficult to think about other, other things that, that it seems that these students are crazy, that they the are radical, anachronic, that they're too radical. <laughs> yeah. But that, yeah, and that only means how effective has been the status quo into promoting this standard view of our reality as the desirable a state of things as a desirable democracy. And it doesn't take much to begin to interrogate that critically. But it shows you that at the same time, sometimes it, it takes a lot because people are so attached. That's the common sense. That common sense defines their sense of, of family, of identity, of what they have, of the feelings of what they deserve and what not. And when some groups begin to question the premises of all of that, it, it takes, it takes a, a lot on the, those subjects. And especially, I think, when we begin to question the whole notion of white privilege. But we have to go to a break. When we come back, we'll talk about this a little further. We'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me Today, the ITV Networks, with my very special guest, and this is Professor Nelson Maldonado Torres here at the UNISA Summer School, and we're talking about the different kinds of conversations that he's unpacking during the week that he will be lecturing here. So, Professor, we spoke a little bit about decolonization and the fear that is gripping many academics, and of course, even, as I said before we went to the break, this questioning of white privilege, people are just don't know how to respond to it, and anything that you say after that, then you automatically automatically you're a racist or you hate white people and you hate all white people etc and that's how the conversation usually turns. Now interestingly I see that your first lecture is about fear, colonialism and coloniality and then you also weave this into narrative of decolonization and decoloniality. What were you trying to unpack in this particular lecture? Yes, this, these lectures actually are um, based on in a paper that is being circulated by the Franz Fanon Foundation and is entitled Out Outline of 10 theses on, on coloniality and decoloniality. Yeah. 
So the first thesis is that colonialism provokes anxiety and fear. The question, the, even the topic, right? And so, and they arise um, uh, anxiety and fear because they question the sense of legitimacy mm -hmm. of the nation state, of the basis for determining property and resources. So immediately, as soon as anything like colonization or decolonization is brought up to the table in any discussion, you can automatically count. You can count on a number of responses that will try to evade the issue, reduce it, uh, minimize it, completely uh, ridicule it. Negate it. it. Yeah, nega okay. so from, from every, I mean, sometimes it is, oh, but my people were also colonized and we're not complaining. <laughs> Everything, every kind of ridiculous, like even the standards of reason and rationality come down to the, to the child, le child level yes. because it's inconsistent immediately. So you just mention it because people are anxious, yes. because it's challenging that, right? So it is the first thesis because uh, the idea is whenever you're going to make any thesis about coloniality or decoloniality, Whenever you're going to introduce any idea about those topics or those questions, what is going to happen is that these are the responses that you're going to get. And, and so I want to stop you there. Is, is this then for you like a, a wonderful movie that's playing itself out? Because that's exactly what we saw here in South Africa when mm -hmm. the students to, started to demand uh, fees must fall and free decolonized quality education. Because the kind of comments that was spread, and especially through social media, oh, you want free education, so you're going to drop the standards if we're decolonized. Yes. What does it mean, decolonized? So, so then, you know, you also so bring in your African huts and your straw masks. Yes, and things like that. Yes, so these kind of narratives are then planted in order to avoid dealing with the real issues. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, I've been in uh, studying and participating in, in various processes for decolonization and bringing the question of colonization as a relevant one. So I've been in, in enough context where that I see that, right? Yes. But last year, after our interview and the conference last year, the summer school last year, I stayed in South Africa for three months, yes. the initial ones, and they were very heated in terms of the fees must fall, strikes and opposition. And in the process, I was invited to many different places to talk, yes. even here in UNISA in different departments. And I went to you know, Cape Town and, and uh, BITS and I went to different places and different departments, something's in the same university. So I began to see these responses come from the experience of being in South Africa, both reading in the newspapers the responses of the media mm -hmm. to, the, to how, how absurd, right? How childish were the responses that somehow are getting their attention and, and have the attention of the media that circulates them. And then when I go to the, that, and that's at the popular level, right? Then I go to the university, to the halls of academia, and I find the same childish responses, the same anxiety, the same. So I say, this is something interesting. Whenever you drop these themes, no matter what, in what institution, in what part of the country you are, everybody behaves, or a lot of people behave in the more really irrational, childish way, okay. trying to discount what you say. So you can explain something. And then they will repeat what you said, but it's a completely different version. So it is not the typical dynamic of understanding and misunderstanding and back and forth. No, it doesn't happen with topics like this. So this is intentional ignorance? Would you say it's almost as if they're displaying a kind of intentional ignorance or an intentional um, disrespect for what you're presenting? I think it's a combination of implicit, unintentional, and intentional attachments with the system of power and with the way of thinking. And so the moment these questions about colonization and decolonization, because they point to the question of, you know, um, what is the legitimacy for anyone to be anywhere where they are, right? Mm -hmm. It raises those kind of questions. And you want, you know, usually you take as the point of departure who you are and where you are. And this goes, that begins to unsettle that comfort that you have of belonging the sense of your identity, because remember, you have your culture, and sometimes when you begin to suspect that maybe your culture has been complicit in a problematic process, that raises ethical and political questions for you. But you see, you just want to live in your culture. You just want to appreciate your language. 
you just want to leave the beauty and, and you know. That's much of the discussions that was raised around Afrikaans must fall, especially. Mm -hmm. And then we, we yes. saw that kind of comments coming out very, very, very yes. often. Yeah. So, so fear, colonialism and coloniality raise these kinds of anxieties. Yeah. And so when you speak about, you know, um, decolonization, you made a very powerful comment this morning. You said decolonization is anti-catastrophic. It is about restoring the metaphysical order. What do you mean by that? Yes. Well, I, I took some time, and this is presented in, in the thesis, right? The extent to which um, colonialism, and let's say coloniality, is not only a matter of uh, a political action, um, but it involves multiple areas, multiple politics, the economy, the legal system, all of it very concrete, but also basic philosophical principles are changed, are distorted, are accommodated to the new order so that they serve as a foundation to the new order. So the order of coloniality is so strong because it was able, it was successful to coordinate reinforcing paradigms of practice and thinking in different levels, from, the, from, the, from institutions of the nation state to cultural practices, to the common sense, to basic philosophical and theoretical principles. So, for me, metaphysics it refers to the discussion of the, those basic philosophical principles. Right? So what it does is that, and this is following Fanon, that um, you follow in Fanon, he has an idea of what, how should we conceive of these basic philosophical principles, like being, thinking, subject, other, right? ethics. How should we conceive of them so that it really, we conceive of them in a, in a really humane fashion? as maximizing humanity, right? And when we compare, and then let's see how, how is it that these different elements come together in our contemporary colonially structured reality. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that the difference is, is the difference between this human order and then a catastrophe <laughs> okay. that has a complete disorder change with, the, with, that, with that order. So dehumanization is anchor in the catastrophic destruction of that metaphysical order and the implantation of a new one. And it's that contemporary reading of the world at the moment, yes. this, cat this catastrophe. So in order to get out of this catastrophe, you need decolonization. Exactly. So, so somebody will ask you, so how do you get decolonization? And there is that we can go to Dr. Fanon when he resigned from the hospital and he decided to join a process of revolution and he also wrote and shared his ideas about it uh, because there is much material out there. And uh, sometimes the question about how do we do this is a question of ev evasion and defense that we get from people because they do not want to take the time to figure out how to and do to it. And to learn. Yes. So it's, it's okay to learn, continuously learn the Western canon or to it's learn so, the that's same okay. is okay. That's you always yeah. need. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, but to go the other but way. To ex exactly. Uh, but, uh, but then again, the, the argument that puts forward is because these people can't really teach you because they can't really think, isn't it? So it's a question of evasion to try and, and, and give authority to somebody whom you consider less than mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. Is that the big struggle in terms of raising this whole concept of decolonization? That is one of the, yes, that is, and that's what is the first thesis. Okay, <laughs> challenging the fear and overcoming it. We're at the end. What would be your parting comments to our guests? Well, that as difficult as it is, we're also building communities of opposition, insurgent communities of decolonization in thought, in practice, and so on. And it's very important to take ourselves seriously. And as much as questioning there can be out there, we also need to look at each other and to build together these ideas and these practices so that we continue advancing decolonization. And I just want you to leave me with a parting thought. Would you therefore then say that decolonization is not necessarily this kind of concept that people believe it's about exceptional or brutal violence? Exactly. Well, uh, the, part of the problem is that colonization is violent. So any disruption of colonization is already seen as too violent. Right? So I think I'd rather try to decenter the question, redefine the question, let's say, um, Let's say that decolonization takes multiple forms of activity, multiple forms of activity. And, and um, if you follow Fanon, for example, the ultimate goal is love and understanding. Mm -hmm. So if violent were to be used, like it was used in his context, is not an, in, in itself by no means. Mm -hmm. And it's used, it, it, when it's used, is last resort thought about, you know, extremely carefully. Uh, but uh, there are so many more things that can be done and be very productive 
so that there should be no opposition to enter to decolonization or be involved because you don't want to be violent. Well, you will be violent because the system will regard you as violent nonetheless, but you don't have to be violent necessarily in the way that you and take. Form of yes, violence. yes. Okay, so thank you very much for sharing these insights. It's always amazing listening to you, and we're looking forward to your book at the end of this year. Until we meet again, fear Manila, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa